What is wrong with Russians? Is it true that all Russians support the war being consumed by patriotic fervor? And if this support is overestimated, what prevents the displeased people from overthrowing Putin and stopping this massacre? That's what we are going to talk about today in this video. My name is Nikolai Martinenko. I have lived in Russia for all my life. I'm against Putin's regime. I wish freedom for Russia. And of course, I support Ukraine in this war. Let's start. But before we answer all these questions, we need to understand what kind of country Russia is. An important heads up. This is an educational video, but not a comprehensive piece of political science. We cannot include all details, otherwise this video will be a few days long. Also, if you find inaccuracies in my story, you are very welcome to post them in the comments below. Russia is a country where all branches of power are controlled by the president. The United Russia Party, led in fact by Putin, has 72% of the seats in parliament and doesn't need the support of other parties to pass laws. This makes passing of new laws extremely fast and without discussion, which are so undiscussed that some time ago the Speaker of Russian Parliament even said that Parliament, quote, is not a place for discussion. The courts are not independent but subordinate to the executive branch. Judges are in fact appointed and dismissed by the President. Moreover, courts are not independent from the police. This is evidenced, for example, by share of acquittals in criminal cases, which is less than 1%. The executive branch is over-centralized. The name of Russian Federation is a formality. Regional governors are completely dependent on Kremlin decisions and money. The fact that governors are appointed personally by Putin. Control over the regions is also carried out through tax. Locally collected taxes are transferred to the Kremlin and then redistributed among regions. Furthermore, there is an excess of security forces. Russia ranks first in Europe and fourth in the world in terms of the number of police officers. However, this does not contribute to a decrease in the crime rate, since they are mired in bureaucracy and corruption. There is one thing they do quite effectively, though, persecuting opposition and people taking part in peaceful demonstrations. In Russia, the level of well-being is low. Corruption is very widespread. There are many problems with the healthcare, educational and social systems. Large profits from the sale of fossil fuel end up in the pockets of small group of people. All of them are part of the close circle of Vladimir Putin. This leads to colossal wealth disparity, while social elevators are integrated into the enormous bureaucratic system. A lot of people choose to become part of it to become officials, policemen, military men, intelligence agents, or go to work in one of the oil or gas companies, most of which are directly or indirectly controlled by the government. There are people in Russia who are dissatisfied with the order of things. They try to attract attention to problems, to express their opinion and influence the situation somehow. However, they can hardly do it, because there is de facto no freedom of assembly speech in Russia. And yes, it's just awful. But surely the Russians have been choosing such a system themselves, as they continue voting for the ruling party and the current president? Let's figure it out. A system that has formed in Russia only pretends to be a democracy. The fact is that Putin doesn't know how to win fair elections. There was only one election in which he participated without having substantial and fair advantages over competitors from the start. This occurred years before he ran for president. He was heading a campaign for then mayor of St. Petersburg, Anatoly Sobchak. And this election was lost. Ever since, while in power, he diligently subordinated himself and forced the institutions of elections to degrade. Already in his first presidential campaign in 1999-2000, Putin enjoyed outstanding support of the most influential media of the time, television. Channel One, then owned by one of the oligarchs, Boris Berezovsky, used its full capacity to promote Putin as someone above the electoral process. While all other candidates participated in TV debates, all news programs were focusing on Putin and his great deeds as already acting president. Over these years, this developed only further. Now with all public TV channels and a great deal of internet media portraying the same narrative. However, this regime does not shy away from direct fraud either. Studies done by mathematician Spilkin focus on analyzing statistical anomalies in the distribution of electoral results. In a fair election, neighboring polling stations have almost identical results. People living in a few hundred meters from each other 
tend to vault similarly. Large differences between neighboring polling stations directly point towards external influence, in other words, manipulation and fraud. Evidence of fraud has been observed in every presidential and parliamentary elections since 2000, based on a Gaussian distribution. The scale of fraud has been only growing over the years. How does this fraud work? The desired candidate is simply assigned votes in one of the two ways. Either the voting stage by throwing in additional ballots, or at the counting stage by manipulating the final protocol. That is why a large number of areas look abnormal, where the results show two round percentages. But there are tens of thousands of polling stations across Russia, which means that there are hundreds of thousands of Russians participating in this, right? Thus, many ordinary Russians are engaged in election fraud. Why do they do it? A typical location for a polling station in Russia is an ordinary public school. Teachers there, whose income and employment completely depend on the state, face a choice cooperate in the fraud and get substantial sum of money for one day's work or try to sabotage it, which can result in them losing their job and their only source of income. Over the years, the system selects for the ones who cooperate. There have been attempts to resist the fraud, as numerous volunteers participated in the elections as observers, which led to an exceeding number of violations becoming public, but this could not impact the situation on a scale of the whole country. Moreover, over the years, it has become exceedingly challenging. Observers are often not allowed to enter the polling station or forced to leave, get detained or even beaten. In addition to fraud, Putin also found a workaround, namely the refusal to register for elections. Electoral commissions deliberately build impenetrable and non-transparent barriers in the way of an opposition candidate or party. To participate in the elections, a candidate often needs to collect a large number of signatures from the potential voters, after which handwriting experts appointed by the Kremlin check these signature lists for errors such as typos or inaccuracies. If these experts reject more than 10% of the signature sheets, the candidate simply cannot participate in the elections. This checking and rejecting is non-transparent and arbitrary, making it another instrument of electoral control. After some of the signatures were rejected as fake, the signatories themselves came to appeal proving their identities on the camera, which still was not convincing enough for electoral commission. The Putin regime also makes it difficult to collect signatures. The collectors are disturbed by aggressively behaving provokers, and the police are not only passive, but they also detain the signature collectors for several hours supposedly to check documents. However, even if a candidate still managed to pass the signature barrier, this doesn't mean that she or he will participate in the election. An administrative or criminal case can be spontaneously fabricated against a candidate, depriving him of the opportunity to be elected for a period of time that would end after the election takes place. Since 2020, the Putin regime has come up with another scheme. A very special election was organized to amend the constitution and grant Vladimir Putin a right to get elected till 2036. During the period prior to the voting, it was legally prohibited to campaign for leave everything as it is option. However, after recent referendums in Ukraine, you should understand what voting is in Russian. Lest the lack of real opposition be so obvious, there are several parties that only imitate political activity. Their affiliation with the Kremlin has been repeatedly proven by many independent journalists. When voting concerns insignificant topics, these opposition parties can vote differently from Putin's party or even criticize its decisions. However, on all important votings, they unanimously vote similarly to the ruling party confirming their imitating nature. Moreover, these oppositional parties are actually funded by the government itself. These other parties do not criticize the president and the government and their leaders do not change for decades. While being repeatedly discredited by the media, independent parties simply do not get registered and the media does not cover that. Most people in Russia are simply unaware that other candidates existed, but were simply not allowed. Those Russians who understand all this are persuaded by Russian propaganda not to come to the polling stations, to boycott the elections, or to spoil the ballots, allegedly expressing protests. The Putin regime directs public opinion in the direction of politics is a dirty business and you should not participate in it. One person will not affect anything anyway. All elections are corrupt. The winner is known in advance.
Some fraud is even demonstrative in order to further demotivate Russian civil society. As a result, opinions such as I'm not interested in politics, politics do not concern me, are strikingly popular among Russians. It's fashionable in Russia to be apolitical. Most Russians still don't understand that this is only playing into Putin's hands. This is often referred to as learned helplessness. A situation when one has potential means to improve one's situation for the better, but is utterly convinced that it's impossible. When elections are so unpopular and people are convinced that their participation is fruitless, even daylight fraud doesn't cause public outrage and allows the system to continue consolidating power throughout election cycles. And it turns out a vicious circle. The exclusion of competitive candidates reduces the interest of voters in the elections themselves. The less interest in the elections, the less turnout. The lower the turnout, the fewer honest observers. The fewer honest observers, the more falsifications. The more falsifications, the more it's necessary to imitate real democracy. The more imitation, the better it can be seen. The better you see it, the greater the feeling of hopelessness. The greater the feeling of hopelessness, the less support opposition candidates have. The less support opposition candidates have, the easier it's to keep them out of the elections without fear of protests. And yes, the deception is obvious when it's all told this way. But you thought, and perhaps still think, that Russians really elected Putin? After all, if you do not delve into it, then the elections in Russia seem generally legitimate, even though there are some violations. But Russians live in this system, and they should better understand that they are being deceived, right? You can say, well, this whole system has been under construction for two decades. Many Russians do not see the big picture because they got into the vicious circle after it started. To help understand domestic politics in Russia, let's use a metaphor. Imagine 100 people in a cafe. 40 of which want strawberry ice cream and 60 want a chocolate donut. The donut was excluded from the menu and replaced by a chocolate ice cream. Two out of three chocolate donut lovers are upset by the absence of donuts and do not order anything, meaning boycotting the election. The remaining 60 people came, of which 40 voted for a strawberry ice cream and 20 voted for chocolate. The electoral commission threw in another 20 ballots for strawberry ice cream. As a result, strawberry ice cream wins with 75% with a turnout of 80%. And this is another thing on which Putin's dictatorship is built. His goal is to convince everyone that people who want the chocolate donut are in the minority. Most importantly, convince these people themselves. This is what he does really very well. After all, it would never occur to anyone that in fact there are more Russians who are against the war in Putin than those who support it. Perhaps if this were so, then the war would not have started, but we don't know how it really is. And nobody knows literally nobody, even Putin. In the absence of fair elections, it is surveys and opinion polls that could provide the information about the public opinion. But here it is not that simple either. From 2012 on, various laws restricting freedom of speech have been introduced. Every year someone is sent to jail for making a wrong social media post or posting an inappropriate comment. These are relatively rare occasions meant to show what could happen for speaking out against the general line of Kremlin. This leads to a general feeling of anxiety when publicly expressing opinions on social matters. It is much safer to just keep quiet and the widespread fear of the big brother doesn't help social scientists to gather reliable information. As a result, around 95% of people simply refuse to participate in opinion polls and the remaining 5% are likely biased to respond in the safest way. Moreover, most available poll data are gathered by institutions affiliated with the Kremlin. Their questions are often formulated in a way to lead the respondent to the correct response. Satisfactory poll results can be then used to convince the opposition in the Russian society and the Western media that the vast majority of Russian citizens support every Putin's decision. Thus, opinion polls in Russia are prone to extreme bias and, in reality, no one really knows the public opinion in Russia. However, there is voting with your feet. Ongoing immigration of young professionals has been on for years, and the outbreak of the war has stimulated this trend. Compare the quiz of those fleeing mobilization at the border and these quiz at the military registration and enlistment offices to get to the front, which do not exist.
Military censorship silences the voices of anti-war Russians, but this concerns more the expression of one's position on the internet and in conversations, and not the real opinion which we had difficulty hearing even before the war. According to some experts, the statistics are very roundly 25% for the war, 25% against, and 50% are those who conform with the opinion of the power. The more accurate numbers are simply impossible to know. Public opinion in Russia is also influenced by controlling what information is available. It's used to concern TV, radio and other traditional media, but in the last few years it has also spread to the Internet. On the territory of Russia, access to numerous websites of opposition organizations and independent media outlets is simply blocked along with some social media, such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Pressure on freedom of speech also takes place through declaring people and organization so-called foreign agents. This status leads to various legal and funding challenges for opposition politicians and independent journalists. Some political organizations and foundations are declared undesired organizations and extremists, which makes it dangerous even to share their posts on social media. Criminal cases, searches, fines. This is everyday life of those journalists and politicians who do not want to shut up. The last two significant ways to get information from an independent source are Telegram and YouTube channels. For different reasons, the Russian government decided to use these platforms for propaganda instead of simply blocking them. On the one hand, a large variety of pro-Russian bloggers on these resources are directly or indirectly funded by the Russian government to support. Next to that, organizations affiliated with the Russian government maintain both farms, who have two main purposes – create an illusion of majority supporting the government and bully people disagreeing with the government. An important aspect of all these propaganda sources is that they rarely say exactly the same. For example, whenever civilian structures are bombed in Ukraine, dozens of contradicting explanations are generated, so getting the truth seems impossible. Overall, the current media field is full of propaganda of all kinds and flavors. Access to independent media is often difficult and sometimes even dangerous. The way Russian propaganda works is similar to a DDoS on the human brain, eventually overwhelming it and breaking the barrier of critical thinking, forcing people to start doubt whether such a thing as truth even exists. If you want me to make a detailed video on how propaganda works on the example of poisoning of Navalny or downing of Malaysian Boeing, write about it in the comments and like this video. As soon as I get 100 likes, I will release a detailed video. And in order not to miss it, subscribe to the channel and click on the bell. But how did Russia come to this system? How did it all start? How did the Russians allow a tyrant to power? Didn't they try to resist him? This will be a topic for our next video. But can the Russians find a way out on their own? During the years of Putin regime, many have fallen into apathy. Many have become victims of propaganda. Russia is like a ship in the middle of the fog, sailing at full speed towards a waterfall and below a civil war. A civil war in a country with nuclear weapons. The passengers on the boat have either embraced despair or they blindly believe the captain whose only focus is his personal safety and nothing else. Unfortunately, Russian civil society is in a situation that requires outside help. Of course, it's very easy to put all Russians in one box, turn one's back and say that the nation deserves its own political system, or just say that situation in Ukraine requires payback and the whole nation is responsible, which has some truth, but this high moral ground will not make Europe any less safe. It is the strong voice of a democratic, peaceful Russia that will. If you care about the fate of Ukraine, security in Europe and bringing a close end to this war, the thing I want to say is that I do too. And this video, along with all other projects of Free Russia NL, are driven by this feeling of care and responsibility. Many of us invest a lot of their time and energy. Please help us make a small but important difference. Recommend this video to your friends, share it on your social networks, let more people understand what problem of Russia really is. Thank you.